Welcome to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I'm Baxter Colburn. No Simon Provan this week. He is off in the great state of Oregon, or Oregon, or, or whoever cares how you pronounce it. But uh, he is off uh, doing some stuff for his acting career. Uh, and he will be back, uh, not next week, but the week after. So, Simon, we will miss you and wish you well, sir. Uh, he did get to go see a Portland Timbers game while he was there, though. So, very jealous about that and uh, hope he enjoyed it. I think they won, too. I think they won 2-0 for him as well. So, nice of the team to get a victory for Simon while he was there. He's a big Timbers fan. Uh, anyway, though, we will be joined later in the show uh, by Corey Plath. He's going to be joining us to talk mostly U.S. Women's National Team today. And we also have a few other special surprises later on in the show as well. Uh, before we get to that, though, uh, remember you can check us out on social media on Facebook at 2UpFront. That's the number 2, not T-W-O, 2UpFront. And then also on Twitter at 2UpFrontSoccer. So check us out on both of those. Uh, if you ever have any comments or thoughts about the show or things that happen uh, in the world of soccer and you're curious to get Simon and I's opinion, please let us know. We're always happy to answer any questions that you have. Also, you can listen to us on Sports Radio America, as you're doing right now, so thank you for that. Uh, on Fridays from 3 to 6 Eastern, uh, you can also go to Tune In and Live 365 to listen to that show live when it's broadcast on SportsRadioAmerica.com. Then you can listen to us on demand anytime, anywhere, in the car, on a walk, on the soccer field, in the bathtub, no matter where you decide to listen to us, uh, on Spreaker.com and on iTunes as well. Give us a like, rate us, download the podcast, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your enemies. We'll make them a soccer lover. We don't care. Soccer brings everybody together. Uh, so we appreciate your listenership. And uh, at this time, I am excited to welcome in Corey Plath. So, Corey, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Doing well. I am excited for this upcoming broadcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have you here. You and I uh, actually got to call a game together uh, earlier during the fall semester of college. We called a women's soccer game together. It was an experience, to yeah. say the least. Yeah, it was. Unfortunately, the women didn't win. But No, uh, that's kind of how our college team plays, though. Yeah, it we happens. Kinda, we kind of got used to that. But it was fun. It was the camaraderie, Corey, that made it so much more interesting, right? Yeah, it was great to be along such great company. Yes. Well, uh, for the listening audience out there, since you are a guest of the show, uh, give us a little bit of background about your soccer knowledge, uh, if you used to play, who your favorite teams are. Just give the give the people a little taste of what Corey Plath is. Well, I've been playing since I was really little. I started out uh, playing uh, goalkeeper. Ooh, and bold. uh yeah, my mom didn't like it so much, but uh, I enjoyed it. And then I uh, switched to a midfield position, and then finally I ended up playing defense. I uh, played through high school and uh, was originally going to play college soccer, but due to a number of injuries, decided against it. So uh -huh. um, it ends at, at high school, but I'll play uh, adult ball around the city and everything go. like that. A good old-fashioned beer league, as it were, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, why not? Everyone loves a good beer league. And soccer, too. The beer. Yeah. yeah. Beer and soccer. Um, anyway, so that's exciting, though. Uh, do you uh, support any club teams, national teams? Where does your allegiance lie? Well, I just follow right now just the um, – as of right now, it's it's the women's national team. Mm. That's the big That's the big one that's happening right now. As far as MLS, I just do a, a – well-rounded view of it but i was really excited to hear that the uh, minnesota united was going to join the mls yes so, yep, um, be the, coming the from minnesota that was big news and so i actually will have a team to follow now hey that's a good thing you're ahead of me i mean wisconsin doesn't have a, an expansion team at all, or soccer team at all uh down in florida where, I'm, where i am from we do have orlando city now so that's a big thing uh, a lot of people that i know in florida are very excited about that uh, there's talks about david beckham bringing a team to miami but it's all talk and people can't really decide what they want to do yeah. so aside from that the other closest team to us is the puerto rican islanders from the nasl but yeah who follows the nasl no people do it's good carmelo anthony's actually one of their owners oh fun, really fun fact of the day wow yeah Fun fact. But uh, so, Corey, you're going to be chatting with us uh, for a majority of the show today. Uh, we've got a lot of U.S. national team talk to get to, especially with the Women's World Cup uh, in full swing. Um, so for those of you that are looking for more MLS talk, uh, we won't be hitting on it too much this week. Uh, it is mostly Women's World Cup, specifically with the U.S. Men's na or the U.S. Women's National Team, not U.S. Men's National Team. That's Gold Cup is next month. 
July. Correct. So that'll be uh, interesting. We'll talk about the roster, too, uh, the official 23 roster for that a little bit later on in the show as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but, Corey, uh, first thing we want to do is um, do our 50-50 segment. Now, for those of you that don't know, our 50-50 segment, uh, there is a topic in the soccer world uh, that Corey and I will debate. Uh, we each get 45 seconds to choose a side, and the other uh, does 45 seconds as well. 45 and 45 represent the halves of a soccer match. Put them together, that equals one soccer match. It's only seconds, not minutes, but you get the general concept of it, right, Corey? I suppose so. Okay. It's similar. Y- yeah. It's not exact. No. It's we could go 45 minutes if we want to. Oh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to do that to the people. Oh. That might be painful. But I, I appreciate the suggestion, though. I will add it to the logbook of suggestions uh, that I burn. Do you have a suggestion I, box? Uh, we have an email. Oh. No, we don't have an email. We, don't, we have a Twitter. So oh, tweet us, uh, yeah. Facebook us. There you and go. We will file your suggestions along with the hundreds of millions of other ones we have. Good. Yeah. Would you like to go first or do you want me to go first? Well, if you'd like to go first, go ahead. I'm happy to go first. Uh, the topic that we are debating uh, this week is, is Alex Morgan the best forward for the U.S. women's national team? Now, as those of you know, there is Abby Wambach, Alex Morgan, Sydney LaRue, Kristen Press, and Amy Rodriguez. So, I am going to start the debate with 45 seconds, and then I will stop, and then I will let you take over, Corey, all right? Sounds good. All right, so on your mark, get set, go. All right, so in all honesty, Alex Morgan, I think she is a very talented player, but she is not the best forward on the U.S. women's national team solely because, yes, she's coming back from an injury, but when she does have the ball, she tries to rely on her speed more than her touch. She gets a little too fancy with the ball and realistically ends up costing the U.S. a lot of possessions. In terms of the best forward on the team, it would prob- It still is Abby Wambach. Yes, Abby Wambach took a year off from NWSL competition in order to stay injury-free. I did think that hurt her a little bit, but Abby Wambach, at the end of the day, still the best forward for the U.S. women's national team. Alex Morgan is tied, I'd say, with Kristen Press at number two, and then it would be Sydney LaRue and Alex Rodriguez right after that. Or Amy Rodriguez. Amy I'm Rodriguez. Sorry, not Alex. Not her brother. That's not her brother. So that's my argument. Another 45 seconds on the clock for you, sir. Are you ready? I suppose so. And go. So Alex Morgan is, in fact, the best forward in in the U.S. women's national team. Abby Wambach has fallen off, as Baxter said, over the last year just due to not being able to play. She's looked very slow, uh, almost looked like the pace has just uh, gone over her head and she's not ready for what's coming. Alex Morgan in the last game had men, many great looks to other players on the team. I can think of one in the first half where Abby was called offsides on a little touch-in, and uh, that was set up on Morgan's uh, pass. And so, therefore, Morgan has been playing and has been improving consistently over th- over the last several games, and I believe she is better than any of the other forwards that we have on the team. All right. Well, those are our opinions about this. Uh, let us know what you think about it uh, and in terms of who you think wins this debate uh, by telling us on Twitter, uh, at 2 Upfront Soccer and just letting us know your opinions about it as a whole. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, lots of U.S. Women's National Team talk. Talk about that defense that looks kind of like Swiss cheese, but also good at the same time. It's kind of hard to really figure it out. And then uh, the U.S. is going to be without Lauren Holiday and Megan Rapino next game, too. So... We'll talk about that and so much more. This is Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I'm Baxter Colburn, joined this week by Corey Plath, Simon Provan, my normal co-host, is off in Portland and Oregon for two weeks. Uh, he is doing an acting uh, workshop, I guess, as it were. He's, I don't know if it's a class per se, but he's doing a lot of high intensive acting work out there. So, uh, Simon, you are missed. We hope you were able to tune into the show while you are away, sir, and uh, all the best to you while you're out there and hope you make the most of the experience as well. So, a uh, big thank you to you, Corey, as you were joining us this week. So, Corey, uh, the Women's World Cup 2015 is in full effect right now. And honestly, there is just a lot going on, not only in terms of the U.S. women's team, but all of the storylines going on for the tournament as a whole. Now, before we jump into just the U.S. team, I want to just look around at some of the other, like just the the knockout round as a whole. The knockout round is completely done in terms of round of 16. Mm -hmm. So first game, Australia, I'm sorry, Germany beating Sweden 4-1. Um, not a huge surprise. We know Germany's already one of the Final Four favorites, uh, more than likely a World Cup favorite uh, as well to win everything, especially with how poorly the U.S. has been playing, but we'll get to that in a minute. Sweden, not their best World Cup. Um, they really didn't do well. They finished third in the group of death uh, behind the U.S. and Australia. Not the best result for U.S. or for the Sweden, for the Swedes, I know who they are, for the Swedes and for Pia Sundhag of the former U.S. women's coach. So Germany moves on. Uh, China defeating Cameroon only 1-0. The U.S. plays China now in this next round. So looking at this game, Corey, seeing China only beat Cameroon 1-0, is that encouraging for the U.S. fans to say that a a powerhouse like China only could go 1-0 on a smaller nation like Cameroon? I think yes and no. Uh, you need to be very careful about uh, judging someone based on, an, on a previous opponent because Cameroon is very different than what the U.S. plays. Mm-hmm. Cameroon is very fast, and the U.S., especially their defense, is uh, a slower methodical type of play. And so, therefore, they're looking for opportunities to take the ball away rather than trying to beat you with their speed. And um, I think it was very disappointing for China to only come away 1-0. I believe that they had other chances to to increase that score, but they just not, weren't necessarily good chances. They didn't play as well as many had hoped they would. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, to come away at the win is, is good for China. So Yes, yeah, at the end of the day, obviously, all it really matters is if you win or not. And uh, China's goal coming in the 12th minute, uh, the possession in this game, though, 50-50. Uh, Cameroon, 21 total shots in this game. Five on target. China, only nine. Four on target. But all that matters, though, that game-winning goal in the 91st minute, breaking the hearts of Cameroon. Um, it would have been great to see an African nation make it through, but uh just was not Cameroon's time this year, I guess. Now, uh, the big, big surprise for me, I fell out of my chair when I saw this result, is Australia. Little Australia, the little country that could, the little continent that could, beating Brazil 1-0. I'm shocked, but at the same time, Brazil hasn't been playing good recently. No, they haven't. And Australia finishing second in the group of death, only behind the U.S. Their only loss was to the U.S., a a 3-1 loss. But there were so many signs of positivity from Australia in that opening game against the U.S. and throughout the remainder of their group games. And now they go and beat Brazil, and now they move on to the next round. If there's one team that has a lot of confidence going into this tournament now for the remainder, it's Australia. Absolutely. Now, are they a team to be absolutely scared of, though? Or is this just a hoax where they're like, well, they got lucky and beat Brazil? Well, if you look at what they did in the group stage, as well as um, in, in this round of 16, they have been playing well. They show lapses of concentration, and they show um, very big holes in their defense and midfield. Which the U.S. exploited perfectly in their opening game. But they do have the talent, and they do have the team uh, cohesiveness to be able to be dangerous. I mean, they took down Brazil. Granted, Brazil wasn't on top of their game, but to beat a Brazil team is very positive for an Australian team. Yes. And so therefore going into the quarterfinal against Japan, 
they're doing very well. They're very high on confidence, and that confidence is going to carry them through. Yep, I completely agree. Australia getting that winning goal in the 80th minute. Uh, so I feel it was a little later than they wanted, but at the same time, like we talked about that China-Cameroon game, wins a win, especially right. in the knockout round. Uh, France in the Korea Republic, South Korea, as it were. France goes 3-0. No real surprise there. France has been really steamrolling people recently. And even though the the World Cup is in Canada, it almost feels like a home series for France because of all the, the, the large French population in right. Canada. So 3-0 victory for them over South Korea. Bye-bye, South Korea. Nobody really bats an eye about that, honestly. Canada, though, only beating Switzerland 1-0. Canada has not looked on point all tournament long. Sure, they won their group. Sure, they looked, they had flashes, mo- small little moments of the real high powered, dangerous Canada that people know. But losing or winning 1 0 to Switzerland is, in my mind, almost as bad as the defeat. Switzerland right. is, a, is a decent team, but they're not at that same level that Canada is. Canada has a fast, dynamic, explosive offense that should be scoring a minimum of two to three goals every game. And they really haven't had the competition yet to this point. No. So they, that's why I'm surprised why they don't, why they haven't been outscoring their opponents by numerous goals. But, I mean, you could take a look at the U.S. and say the same thing. Yes. You only come away with four goals in the You're jumping stage. ahead before I want to go I'm, for it. Well, you're jumping I ahead. But you're, I get what you're saying, though. But it's it, this Canada team that had a group of ne- the Netherlands, China, and uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, shoot. Um, where is it? Netherlands, China. I don't remember. Anyways, you know, you, you come away with um you come away with the first place but New Zealand. Yeah, New Zealand no. That's right. Um but they don't you know, these teams aren't weren't, weren't exactly top notch teams. No. And they haven't had the con- competition and so therefore they just they're just not prepared for what's coming. Yes. Yep, no, I believe that there is definitely a storm coming for Canada and it comes in the form of the lionesses from England. England winning 2-1 in their knockout game against Norway. Norway. Norway was that dark horse team that a lot of, t- of World Cup experts were saying, you know, if there was one team this year that might sneak into the Final Four, it might be Norway because England is really good at disappointing people and not making it out of the group stage. So people already wrote off England. They're like, okay, England won't make it out of the group. But they did. They did a good job. Um, they win their game against Norway 2-1 to one, uh, the same day. So they move on and they play Canada next round. Now, the USA, Colombia, we're going to dive into this a little bit more. USA beats Colombia 2-0. Um, it was a poor showing from the U.S., but we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, so then the, the last game that happened yesterday was the defending World Cup champions, Japan, beating the Netherlands 2-1. to Now, Japan has been very quiet, but very dominant. Japan won all three of their group games. And now they beat the Netherlands 2-1. to one. I still am surprised at why Japan is so under-media. Me, I don't, mediatized is not the right word. Obviously, mediatized is not a word. But you get the general concept is they're not getting the media attention that a defending World Cup champion should. Now, last show I had, um, Simon was here, and we also had a guest on, uh, Sonia Kondratenko. And they both agreed, saying it's because they're an Asian nation. And it's not a dig on the Asian race, but the American and North American media do not care as much about the African and Asian teams. They're not a powerhouse. No. But you could I think Japan is though. I think they're a rising team. Yes. I don't I don't they're just not the previous powerhouse that we're used to. Yes. When you think of powerhouses, you think of the US, you think of Brazil, you think of Germany. Germany. Yes. And you know, you, you hear talks of, of Canada too because they've displayed showings of brilliance but it's not you know at the tier of the u.s the germany the Mm -hmm. brazil and so therefore they just haven't had the attention yes no i i I agree and i think that is what has helped japan avoid all the big media frenzy all the overhype that teams like the u.s and canada are suffering from i agree now looking forward to the quarterfinal China and the United States play on Friday night. 
That'll be a big marquee matchup, a rematch of the 1999 World Cup final. Is it 99? I'm pretty sure it was I 99. Think so. Yeah, pretty sure it was 99. Rose Bowl, PK's yeah. shirt flying in the air. Yep, that's what it was. 99. I'm sorry if I got that wrong, anybody, but I'm almost positive it was the 99 World Cup. Anyway, they take each other on on Friday. Uh, also that same day, uh, earlier in the day, you have Germany-France. I'd like to say it's going to be a good game, but honestly, Germany is going to win that game. I agree, but I believe it's not going to be a blowout that Germany's accustomed to. Do you think it's going to be like a 3-2 or a 2-1 kind of game? I say 2-1 or 1-0. That's, that's my prediction. Really? And why 1-0? Why I just I don't, I don't know if Germany can continue the play that they've had. Okay. I, they've been scoring a lot of goals, and it just it, it, in at least in my my uh, past experiences, you can't continue scoring four, five, six goals a game. Even, well, what they score ten in one game? Uh yes, and yeah, they went you, 10-0 on Ivory Coast, which I guess that's not that's not as anything. impressive. That's like beating a college team, right, or a high school team. But you just can't you can't go on that scoring spree. And keep it going throughout an entire tournament. They're I've seen sure, it way too many times. To. They're trying to. But, I mean, going 4-1 against Sweden, though, that's impressive. It is. But it's a struggling Sweden team. Yes. So you can take that for how you like it. Now, if they beat France handily, do they still get the respect? I feel like no matter who they play until they get to the finals, Germany is always going to be the better team. But if they beat them, everyone's going to be like, well, the team they were playing was struggling. Because if they beat France... France is all right, but France is not an elite team. If the U.S. goes through and they beat the U.S., well, the U.S. has been struggling. If China goes through, well, China's not even on the same page as Germany. So they were an underdog that they should have beat. I think no matter how you spin this, at least up until the final, Germany is not going to get the kind of respect they deserve. I just don't think they've been tested. No, they haven't. And so, therefore, it's it's difficult to say, one, how far they're going to go, and Mm -hmm. two... They're finally playing someone that's you know near their competitive level. Yes. And so this game is going to be able to see how well Germany is going to be able to play throughout the rest of the tournament. No, it, it's it's hard to argue against that. Um, flipping over to the other side, Australia and Japan. If there was ever an upset alert, that would be the game. Australia-Japan, because I think Australia is going to push Japan to their absolute limit. I agree. Now, there are those gaps, though, in the Australian defense, like you were mentioning, that we saw Megan Rapinoe do such a great job of exploiting when they played in the first round of the group game. Um, I like Australia to win this game. I don't know if they will, but I I like slash want them to. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's my pick for that game. Um, I mean, realistically, do you think Japan is going to win this game? No. I think you don't. I think Australia, you think Australia is, going, is to going to win this game. I I I believe once again it's going to be a close one. Yes. But it's not going it's I I believe that with the confidence that Australia has been playing playing with as well as, you know, their performance over the last couple of games, they've been they've been throwing um some strong performances together. Mm-hmm. Um through the end of the group stage, their first game against the U.S. was not good. No, it was not a true representation of how good their team actually was. You saw minimal flashes, but it wasn't the type of Australia team that we'd now see. Right. That beat Brazil. Right. And they're they're finally figuring out how to play together, and they're coming together at the right time. And, you know, you hear so many coaches say you don't want to peak too early. Yes. Well, Australia's peaking at the right time. I agree. I completely agree. All right, the last quarter final game, England and Canada, Corey. The host nation trying to prove that they don't actually suck as bad as they've been kind of showing. Eh. England, though, after that 2-1 victory over Norway, England, I feel like, has to be the more confident team going into this game. Would you agree? Yes and no, but if you look at the highlight, if you look at the um, the highlights from the England-Norway game, the Norway or Norwegians scored first, mm-hmm. and it took a very long time for England to come back. And they, I think they scored two in the last ten minutes, or some, it was something like that. And uh, England, you know, for 61st, being first. Well, Norway scored in the fifty-fourth minute. England scored in the sixty-first and seventy-sixth. Okay, so in a ten-minute span. Yes, but England, England should have played a whole lot better than Norway. Yes, and they should have, you know, not. They they should have scored early, to be mm-hmm. quite honest, and and put them away early. But they just didn't put the form, performance together. And I, it's going to be if out of all the 
matches, this is going to be the one that I'm least excited for. Really? And I don't I don't know You're how. The least, I feel like I would be the least excited for Germany France. That's the one I'm most excited about. Really? Not Australia Japan? No. Well, I I guess those two are up there. The I guess the U.S. states China. I'm just I, because sure. nationalistic pride. I'm I'm excited for it. Yeah, well, but as a, so. as a spectator, yes, of the sort of spot of the sport of soccer, it my most excited. I'm most excited for the Germany France one because I want to see which quote unquote powerhouse is mm-hmm. going to come through. Okay, because France has been playing well and they have strung a couple of games together that yes. have been very good performances offensively and defensively, and Germany has just been steamrolling everyone. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm looking forward to, um, obviously, USA-China, but if I had to rank them, I would go Australia-Japan, number one. I would go Canada-England, number two. Uh, USA-China, probably four, and then Germany-France, three, honestly. And that's not a diss against the United States, but I'm just not thrilled with the type of soccer they're playing. Um, But I think that Australia-Japan game has the makings to either one be a wall-to-wall action game or, and honestly, Japan could just be like, look, we're just actually really good and we're going to just destroy Australia, which I hope doesn't happen, but it's the Women's World Cup. Anything is physically possible, though. So we're going to go to another break. When we come back, we are going to dive headfirst into the women's national team and just kind of figure out what the heck is going on. A lot of talking points to get to still. This is Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I'm Baxter Colburn. I'm joined this week by Corey Plath. Simon Provan, my co-host, is out in Oregon uh, doing a bunch of different activities out there. He was at a Portland Timbers game the other day, so super jealous that he got to go to an MLS game, especially for his favorite team. I have yet to go to a New England Revolution game in my my lifetime, but I, I'm still young, 23 years young, and will hopefully get the get to a game eventually. I think they play in Chicago in the next few months, so I might try to get down there for that game. But uh, I'm joined this week by Corey Plath. So, Corey, thanks again for being here. Uh, we chatted in our second segment uh, about the knockout round of the Women's World Cup, the round of 16, and a bit into the previews of the quarterfinals. But we can no longer dodge the fact that we need to talk about the U.S. Women's National Team, Corey. And I, there's so many different talking points, and I will let you choose the first one, Corey. So what about this women's national team and the way they're playing and the upcoming game and their past games? What do you want to dive into first? Well, as you mentioned, there are just so many things that we could talk about. Yes. But coming from a defensive standpoint, defense is really close to my heart. we got to start with the defense. Okay. What about the defense is going on right now, Corey? 
Well, just a number of stellar performances. Um, putting aside the fact that the defense let the Colombians just dribble right in front of them and try to do one-on-one ball. Yes. They've been minimal. Or they've been giving Hope so minimum chances in order to um, have shots. In fact, it, it's ridiculous how few shots have been had on her. And they've just put together a number of stellar performances. But my biggest question is, can a defense hold together a struggling offense? Yeah, that's a very good question because you look at the offense, you look at the midfield specifically. If you take out Megan Rapino from the midfield, who's left that's playing top-notch soccer? Carly Lloyd? Carly Lloyd? No. You don't Not at so? all. Not at all. I Carly Lloyd has been playing some of the worst soccer that I've ever seen from her. I am not thrilled by her performance in this World Cup so far. I always forget she's even on the field because of how few times she touches the ball, and when she does have the ball, she doesn't hold on to it and usually loses it to the other team. See, I'd say that about Megan Rapino. Yeah, see, Megan Rapino is actually scoring goals and is creating offensive chances. Carly Lloyd is not having can barely get the ball out of her own half of the field. I guess where I'm coming from is the first game aside where she had her two goals. Sure. She's put together a couple of good crosses. Yes. I'll give her that. But how many times have you seen her try and go one-on-one against two defenders and not pass the ball into the middle field where it's wide open? Yes, I think most outside midfielders are guilty of that, though. That's part of their nature. I think Tobin Heath is in more of a victim of that than Rapino, but Rapino has the skills to be able to get through those players. Now, I know she doesn't always successfully get through, but Rapino, in that aspect, because she can score goals, because she is so dangerous with the ball and can create free kick opportunities, which we've seen her create a lot of free kick opportunities this year because of all the fouls that have been committed on her, in that regard, it's hard to argue against and say she's not doing anything good because in my mind, as a coach, if I was coaching this team, I would say Rapino's doing miles more for this team than what Carly Lloyd's doing. I would say yes and no. I think part of the part of the reason where she's not getting all their touches is because of the ball is not coming in the middle of the field. Yes. They're staying on, out on the wings and trying to do too much. It just feels like they're they need to cross it in and try and get Wambach and Morgan those headers. Mm-hmm. And so More so Wambach. Not... Alex Morgan's not very much of a head right. friendly. But she had a striker. couple of good chances. She has, yes. She's more of a striker, obviously. She mm-hmm. shoots that ball way more effectively than you will see Wambach. Although Wambach did have a good just turn and just rocket uh, against Columbia. Obviously, the goalkeeper saved it. But it was I was weird. I was like, who shot it? I'm like, who used it? Like, I was like, oh, that was Wambach. She used her foot. Like, I'm not used to seeing Wambach shoot with her feet. I'm and she always... scored with her foot the other yeah, day. Yeah, she had a beautiful volley. That was the decisive goal in that game. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that she still knows how to use her feet. I don't know if I've seen a goal other than her head before. Uh, I don't think I have either. That's Not that I can like vividly remember. I can remember almost any goal that I remember Abby Wambach is always off of a cross. Absolutely. That's what I remember. That's why she scored 184, 183 goals. She I don't scored know. It's 180 up there. some goals. That's all I know. Girl's got it going on. She knows how to score goals and in bunches, and that's why she is the all time leading goal scorer in men's and women's soccer. That's impressive. It is That's impressive. very impressive. And the international level, I should say. Not in club. Cause... And tied with Marta. Yes, for the most goals at a World Cup as a whole. Or, like, throughout a career. They're both at 15 right now. And now Marta's gone, so Abby's got a chance to, as this is her last World Cup, to retire from international duty. And she has an opportunity to become the all-time leading scorer at the World Cup. And now's the time that she needs to prove herself to. Yes. I'll be honest... Speaking, going off of uh, the defense and focusing more on the forwards, looking at Abby Wambach, I think her taking a year off from NWSL action was a horrible idea. I agree. Absolutely horrible. She should have at least played half the season because you saw her in that opening game against Australia, and she was missing wide open headers that nine, that 10 times out of 10 she puts in the back of the net. And it was all with the timing of the jump, too. Yes. She forgot how to jump on most of them. She was like, oh, I jump. Oh, uh, now. No, 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 no. It's like, no, Abby, you've been doing this for how many years on the international level and on the club level, and you've never once had a problem. You scored over 180 goals on the national team. You should know how to jump and time your header right. Right. And you think that's something that you would just come instinctively to her, and I think that's what Jill Ellis was thinking when she started her. I think that's what Abby was thinking when she's like, oh, I'm going to start. I've been doing this for years. No big deal. I got this. And then the ball comes and she freezes and doesn't know how to direct it and jump. And 
So in that regards, that's why we saw her in the second game not start. That's why we saw Sydney LaRue, Kristen Press starting two up front, mm-hmm. which I, I'm curious to know your opinion about Sydney LaRue. I believe that she's she's a very she's a workhorse. She's what every coach wants as as a player. She's yes. someone that's gonna go after every single ball and put her body on the line and make sure that she gets something out of every single possession. Yes, and I think coaches would kill to have players like her on their team. She's not the most talented. That's player. what I'm wondering. Is is the production to match the effort there though? Because at some point. It's great that you can hustle. That's great that you can muscle your way for a ball. But is the talent there to score the goals and bunches that the U.S. needs? Because this is Abby's last World Cup. But then you've got four really good strikers. You've right. got Kristen Press. You've got Amy Rodriguez. You've got Alex Morgan. And you've got Sydney LaRue. Who's the starting two after Abby leaves? It's Kristen Press and Morgan. And Morgan. Even though Sydney, I think Sydney's got more experience on the national team level than Press does. Yeah, but how much ex- how much experience is, is that going to help you with? Yeah, that's true. And I feel like Amy Rodriguez gets thrown to the back burner all the time. Amy Rodriguez is one of the best forwards in the system, obviously. And right. I just feel like she doesn't get the proper time to shine on the national team. But when it comes to club level and the NWSL, Amy Rodriguez is one of the best forwards in the league, if not the best forward in the league. Right, it- I guess my feeling with her is that she's a very good 65-minute sub. Yes. And so, therefore, with her speed, she can tear about, tear apart a very tired defense. Yes. And so, to be able to, and this is all strategy put in place, but yeah. to well, be able to take to, it, yeah. and take a very tired defense and put someone in with her speed, mm-hmm. she'll tear up a defense Nine times out of ten. Yes. Now, speaking of tearing up defenses, obviously Megan Rapino is one that's very good at doing that on the outside wing. Lauren Holiday as well. Neither of those ladies will be on the field for the U.S. women uh, when they take on China on Friday. So, uh, because of yellow card accumulation. They both were yellow carded in the first game against Australia. And if they were to get a yellow card again up until the semifinals, they would miss a game. And sure enough, both of them, nobody else... Both of them received yellow cards in that game against Colombia. Now, say what you will, but I think Abby Wambach had every right to say what she said about the ref and the questionable aspect of the calls against only Rapino and Holiday. And she later she later cleared up her comments and yes. said, you know, she doesn't know what the ref is thinking, which in all honesty we don't, but no, as a course. spectator's standpoint both of those calls were very very questionable to say the least Mm -hmm. no i i I agree and i think that is why when you look at it from a outsider's perspective looking in you have to really understand that a ref's job is not easy no no matter if you've been playing the game for 20 years or if it's your first day on the job every ref that you encounter has a different view of the game and who knows maybe in her in the ref's book that was they were fouls or maybe she was paid off by FIFA and she was headhunting. No, I doubt it. I doubt that would happen. But even still, Holiday and Rapino both gone for the next game. Looking at the U.S. roster, Lauren Holiday plays that center midfield spot. Megan Rapino, that left winger. Who? What? If you're Coach Jill Ellis, Corey, what type of strategy do you look to implement? Do you go to a four-three-three? Do you turn to Shannon Box? And have her play that other center mid but and play more of a diamond. And have Shannon Box be that center defensive mid with Carly Lord, that attacking mid. Tobin Heath on the wing. And then, uh, where'd she go? Morgan Bryan on the other wing? Or do you go to a 4-3-3? Well, I almost feel at this stage you need to go to a 4-3-3. Because we need something in the offensive side of the ball. We can't just keep passing it back and forth between the midfield and the defense and expect to get goals. Yes. Uh, as far as who replaces them, we I believe Shannon Box has a hamstring injury. And so that's why she hasn't shown up in this World Cup. Yes. Well, she did play sparring minutes. Um, not against C- Colombia. She played against, who was the last group game? Nigeria. She spent. She was on the field briefly against Nigeria. 
So I guess we need to see where where she's at, or the the coach would need to see where she's at. But if she can't play a full, you know, sixty five plus minutes, then it goes to Morgan Bryan as a midfield, and then stick Chris and Press in the forward. Yes, and go to a four three three. You also have Whitney Engine as well, uh, who is literally an engine for the U.S. Um, she is a young up and coming player in the NWSL and the U.S. women's system. And is an exciting player um, and somebody that I feel could get an opportunity. She's only been, uh, she's got 29 caps. I'm sorry, she's a defender, but she has spent some time in the midfield as well. Um, Now, obviously, she's overshadowed on the defense because you look at that defense. You've got Julie Johnson, Morgan Klinenberg, Becky Sauerburn. uh, Krieger. Krieger and Allie Krieger, my favorite player. How do I forget Allie Krieger? I'm sorry, Allie. Um, which I want to talk about Allie Krieger for a second because no, aside from Klingenberg and Julie Johnston, Allie Krieger has really just blown my mind of how deadly she is. I did not realize that the U.S. had such dangerous outside backs. Usually the U.S. women's team, as we saw at the 2011 World Cup, their defense was more whole, had more holes in it than Swiss cheese. Like, mm-hmm. it was horrible. And then they bring in Julie Johnston, mm-hmm. uh, a young player from the NWSL up in the system. Allie Krieger didn't see a lot of time, I don't believe, in 2011 as well. I don't even know if she was in the system at that time. Klingenberg was starting to kind of become a thing. And then Becky Sauerburn, obviously, is the veteran out of those four on the defense. And then Christine Rampone, um, but she's not playing a lot in this World Cup, rightfully so. Uh, but it is her birthday today so happy birthday to her. happy birthday uh, for those of you that are wondering like saying no this is friday well we're recording the show on wednesday so in our time it's rapinos or it's rampone's birthday so happy birthday christine so anyway i got to meet her actually oh you younger. did i did i got her autograph i got shannon box's autograph i got abby wombach's autograph and i got rapinos autograph Back only, when... graph, I, only autograph i see is on the internet yeah that's about it mm. i'm pretty sure i have those somewhere I don't know where, but I have those signed. I had a shoe. I took off my shoe that I was wearing at the game. I was like, sign my shoe, because I ran out of paper. <laughs> so Shannon Box and Christina Rampo signed my right shoe. I don't know. Those shoes are since gone, because I was like, meh, couldn't see the signature, and they got you know, faded. So I was like, all right, tossing the shoe. But I still have Rapino and Wombach's autographs on pieces of paper somewhere. They're in my house somewhere. I'm not exactly sure where. Anyway. My two minutes. I tried to get Hope Solo's autograph, but she was like swarmed with people, and everyone was like, "Hold up, give her room." So I didn't <laughs> get one. So she looked at me though. I was like, "I hope." Hi, but she didn't. No, we didn't. Anyway, your hope was crushed. It was. <laughs> I got to see Marta play as well. Anyway, I'm just all full of tangents today. Um, but the defense, though, realistically, though, I feel like is in a great place midfield wise. Though going to a four three three, so then you put Carly Lloyd at center mid, you put Tobin Heath at right mid. Or left, probably you put Tobin Heath at left mid, and then do you put um, Morgan Bryan at right mid, or do you put Kristen Press at right mid, Cindy LaRue at right mid? I would say uh, Morgan Bryan. Yeah? I would say, well, the limited time that Morgan Bryan and Kristen Press have had together, they've been... Uh, they've worked well. Yeah. And and uh, Morgan Bryan knows how to move the ball. And she's been very effective in uh, her limited time playing. And so uh, if I had to do this, I'd say um, we'll put Tobin Heath on the left, Lloyd in the middle, and Bryan on the right. And then have Kristen Press be that right forward too. Oh, okay. See, why not just go complete rogue and go 4-2-4 four, four, and just load up with all the attacking options you have up top and just go. Because we saw it in the Colombian game where we couldn't get the ball out of our our final third. Yes. Yeah, the and U.S. struggled need, with that. We need to be able to – and granted, you're not going to have the skill players that Colombia did. No. As, as the footwork and everything like that. But No other team in this tournament aside from maybe, maybe Germany or Canada is going to really go after you. But it's not every single – player it's you know one or two yes and so against a china team 
we can't afford to have only two in the middle. No, China's very monotonous. They're going to possess the ball. They're going to knock it around and look for that long ball over the top or that cross that happens to find one of their, you know, 5-1 forwards, and they're going to miraculously score, which I still don't understand how that works. But um, it's a miracle of soccer. It is. That's why the game is so, so addicting. Um, so looking ahead, if the U.S. wins, if they beat China and – Nine times out of ten, they will play Germany in the next round. More than likely. I would be shocked if they don't. Is a USA-Germany semifinal game going to be everything that people want it to be, or is it going to be a major letdown? Depends on how well the United States plays against China. They will get Rapino back, and they will get Holiday back. Um, but I just, I'm just i still worried because Abby Wambach is not in full form. Alex Morgan is not back in full form. Sydney LaRue is not performing at a high level. Kristen Press is doing okay, but this is her first World Cup. And then Amy Rodriguez is non-existent. Right. So last I checked, you needed good forwards to be able to win games. And all five forwards for the U.S. are not exactly showing up in bulk and in big numbers. Sure, Abby's scored. Sure, Alex has scored. Kristen scored. But... A lot of those goals, though, were relatively easy goals. Right. Um, I Morgan's goal, I think, was the biggest one. Yes. From my my perspective, that helped take a load of pressure off of her shoulders. Right. After coming back from an injury, yeah, especially with all the uh, expectations that she's had on her, um, with with coming back from the injury, saying that she's ready to go, and people expecting her to play in that first game right away. Mm-hmm. And um, now that she has that goal and it came and she was able to play a full match too. Yeah. It, that's what I was shocked about. You know, I'm just I've really been impressed with the strides that, that she's had over the last four games and uh I just see that continuing. I, I believe that's why she is the best forward. I don't see Abby's play improving, especially after that Miss PK, which completely I I, I, I don't have words for that. I thought I don't for sure that was a goal. I, I yeah, th- you know, you, that's a, a penalty kick is, is one of those almost surefire goals that you can literally turn around to the goal and say, "All right, well, I know we're about to score, so I might as well just go back and get into position." But that didn't happen. Abby blasted it wide, 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 wide. Abby's not a left-footed shooter, so I was confused why she took the penalty kick left-footed. She well, from what I've heard is that she's got a very solid left foot and she's able to control it, but obviously that control failed her. Yes. Because so. we saw in the World Cup uh in 2011 when they were taking penalty kicks, Abby took a one step shot right-footed. Right. And drilled it. No problem. So that's what I thought she was going to do, and then she lines it up left-footed and maybe that was a tactic to throw off the goalie. I don't know what um, but I just was really confused as to why that was the case. And then obviously another penalty kick happens and they see Carly Lloyd step up and take it and drill it, which is fine. Maybe do that from henceforth. Even though I understand you're trying to get Abby as many goals as possible, you're trying to get her to get that World Cup goal uh, record, but at the same time you need to think about realistically who the best penalty kick takers are on the team. And nine times out of ten Abby is, but not with her left foot. Yeah, not right now with as with much as she's been struggling. Yes. You're trying to put way too much back on the shoulders of Abby Wambach, and it's just she needs to be continue to be eased in to that role, and she's not ready for it yet. But I guess I understand why she'd be the number one penalty kick taker. I mean, you would think that, she that would. with her experience and and with all the goals that she scored, she would have the confidence and the composure to be able to put that in the back of the net, and it just did not work. Yes. No, I, I agree. And that's why when she stepped out, I was like, all right, it's about to become, what, 1-0? One one nine one zero. And I was like, all right, no big deal. You know, cool. USA is going to go up 1-0. Awesome. And then, no. And I just her face was like, oh, my gosh. That's why she was like the first person to hug Carly Lloyd when she scored her goal because yeah. she was probably like, thank you for yeah. saving me. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not exactly sure. There's a lot of different ways that you can kind of dissect the play of Abby Wambach and the thinking behind Jill Ellis for starting her and not starting her. Um, but, yeah, is there any other things you want to dive into before we go to one more break, Corey? I guess the one thought that's been running through my head is if we do stick with a 4-4-2, yes. what is the realistic chance that Wambach doesn't start? Next to none. She will start. Wambach will start. This is her last World Cup. You can't 
not start her because if you don't start her and she doesn't play the game and the U.S. loses, how long will the U.S. get ridiculed for not starting Abby Wambach, the all-time leading goal scorer? Da 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 da. The storylines would go on and on and on and on, and I don't feel like Jill Ellis would ever be able to recover from not starting or playing Abby Wambach in a game. But I feel like this is a different situation than say the Donovan situation, Lana Donovan situation, yes. where Klinsman or yeah. Klinsman mm-hmm. was was uh, ridiculed for not bringing him on the team. Yes, but Jurgen Klinsman and Jill Ellis are totally different. Jill Ellis has never had a problem with Abby Wambach. Klinsman had a problem with Landon Donovan. Right. And I just feel like if you look at the performance that she's put together over the last four games, and even before then, she, I mean, she's been struggling for mm-hmm. a while now. She has, and that is why Wambach should have at least played half the NWSL season. When I found out that she was taking the year off, I was like, that's, that's, not, gonna, that's not a good idea. It's not going to work out. And we're seeing that because she's not used to the pace. She's not used to being challenged for headers where I'm sure when she was doing all her practice reps, she probably wasn't getting challenged as hard as she is in the World Cup by other real defenders that don't really want her to score. It's a little different in practice when you've got you know, your friends bumping you a little bit. Right. It's totally different. Different speed, different pace, different atmosphere, everything. Which I understand why you would want to take a year off. You yeah. Know, you, need, you need time to recover. She has. She's broken her leg. She's gone through injuries. I get that. She needs to be able to recover and keep her body in the best shape possible. But she, she lacked the on-field experience, and I think that's what really ended up hurting her. Yeah, you can't expect to play at the same level that you did before you left. No. You, you, it's, it's just not going to happen. No. No, I completely agree. All right, well, we're going to go to another break. When we come back, we're going to revisit... A wonderful pastime from our childhood. We're going to step away from the U.S. Women's National Team for a while uh, and focus on something from our childhood for a little bit. And then we have our I Believe segment as well, so don't you don't want to miss that. This is Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I am Baxter Colburn, joined this week by Corey Plath. No, Simon Provan, my wonderful co-host. He is off in the Great Plains of Oregon, uh, doing some stuff to further his theatrical career. So he is an actor at heart and uh, is out there doing some exciting things for him to help further his career as a whole. But I am joined by Corey Plath this week. So Corey, thanks again for being here. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, anytime. You having fun so far? Absolutely. Yeah. You're Nothing doing... better than talking about soccer. Right? Honestly. Like, come on. Why don't more people do this? I mean, it's honestly the best sport. Yeah. Ever. Uh, well, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I may be biased. What about the Packers? What about football? Well, I didn't say the best team. I said the best sport. 
Well, you're, that's, I'm assuming, though, that if you mean that it's the best sport, that you're saying that, the football, that football and the Packers are not as good. I would say that the Packers, going to a Packers game is the best climate ever, oh. but I would say that soccer is the best sport. So you, okay, I'm going to play this game for you. Would you rather, would you rather go to a rivalry Packers-Bears game on primetime TV in like November when it's cold, but not too cold, just enough, um, or would you rather go to a USA-Mexico game in Columbus, Ohio, where the Dos Acero is so prevalent and so iconic. What kind of a match is it? Friendly? A. Um, blah, 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 blah. I, I mean, <laughs> if we're going to play this, we've got to play it right. We do. we got to play it right. A Gold Cup final. Oh, then it's soccer. It is. Yeah? Even though all the, the good players wouldn't be there? Yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, it's... A World Cup final! USA... No, the USA-Mexico would never be a World Cup final. Well, don't it... say never. Just not in the very... Not in our lifetime. No, not not anytime soon. Not, no. But speaking of the U.S. roster, uh, we're going to flip sides to the men. We've talked about the women for a while. We, the uh, Gold Cup roster came out uh, for the CONCACAF Gold Cup. And uh, Jurgen Klinsmann has officially named his 23 players. Now, this is a team, Corey, that is coming off two massive, massive road wins. They beat number six, Netherlands, uh, and the uh, reigning World Cup champions, Germany. Yeah, that was... I I wasn't able to watch either game live, be it just due to working, but... um, I remember getting texts, and my brother said, "Don't wa- uh, don't look at any highlights. Don't look at what the score is. Yes, just go on to uh, ESPN or three dot com and just watch it there. And okay. you won't you won't see what the score was. And I my jaw hit the floor several times. Yeah, yeah. I I was not able to watch either game. I did watch highlights after the end because I got the notifications. It's like da 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 da. I'm like, oh, ESPN. What's up? Check it on my phone. What the USA wins? I was floored when they beat Netherlands. I'm like, okay, Netherlands must not have had all their good players. This and that. Bobby Wood got lucky with the goal. Whatever. Then they go and they do the same thing to Germany. Bobby Wood again with the game winning goal. I'm like, okay, number one, who the heck is Bobby Wood? Number two. Why is he not getting more playing time? Number three, oh, I guess we're kind of good. Where was this team? Like, right? honestly. And we didn't even have, like, Dempsey or, well, or Altidore or can, anything like that, which, yeah. you know, you can make your your uh, your arguments of whether or not that would have changed something. I'm or, not a Josie fan, just FYI. Well, I, never, you never know, been a some Josie people fan. are, some people aren't. Well, I didn't know what your 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 thought process was on Josie. He's I, very inconsistent. I've never when been, he's, when I've never he's been a Josie on, fan. When he's on, he's he's really good. But yes. when he's even semi off, he's just off. He's just terrible. No, no, I, I agree. I agree. All right. So looking at this roster uh, briefly before we move on to the rest of our show, uh, at goalkeeper you have Brad Guzan, uh, Nick Romando, and William Yarbrough. Uh, William Yarbrough, an exciting up and comer. Um, I believe that the U.S. soccer system is hoping that he will have a long-standing career after Tim Howard and Brad Guzan are done uh, with their time in net for the U.S. Because obviously Tim Howard is on his year hiatus. Uh, Brad Guzan is doing his very best as the number two goalie to keep up with that. And then Nick Romando is not the worst goalie, but he's not the best goalie either. He's obviously that number three goalie for the U.S. If you had to go Howard, Guzan, who's next? Romando's obviously number three. But William Yarbrough, though, He's definitely a good up-and-comer to keep your eye on. Yeah. Uh, looking at the defense, uh, Venturo Alvarado, uh, John Brooks, Timmy Chandler, not thrilled by that, no. Brad Evans, really, Omar Gonzalez, Fabian Johnson, and Tim Ream. Um, well, here's the thing. Uh, Brad Evans and Timmy Chandler do not need to be on this team. Uh, I believe that you need to have players with, by the names of Matt Beasler and Breck Shea mm-hmm. um, on the defense. Tim Ream, uh, knowing Klinsman, he probably feels sorry for him, but won't play him. Yeah. Because Tim Ream has been called up for multiple international games and has not seen the field 
for more than five minutes. Which I don't understand why Bolton would let him. Yeah, you'd think they'd learn by now saying, hey, Klinsman, you've called up uh, our star center back, Tim Ream, and you don't play him when he comes and when he comes. Which I don't know if that's part of the contract or something like that. But why call him up if you're not going to play him? Yeah. To give him training? Yeah. You can get training from Bolton. Yeah. Bolton's Uh, probably a better team than the U.S. Men's National. It doesn't make sense, but. No, it really doesn't. Uh, Midfielders, Kyle Beckerman. Eh, he's old. He's very old. I don't think he needs to be uh, on the national team anymore, personally. Uh, Alejandro Bedoya, Michael Bradley, Brad Davis, Mix Discarude, Alfredo Morales, DeAndre Yedlin. They're apparently calling him a midfielder nowadays. Jassy Zardes, who's technically a forward, and Graham Zussi. Uh, thoughts about the midfielders? Like it? Not like it? Somebody missing? Anybody shouldn't be there? What are you feeling? Um, well, I, I guess the big blow is the fact that... Um, Oh, what's his name? I forgot his name. Uh, I can't help you. Yeah. If you I, don't know his name. He, he, defensive midfielder. That Jermaine just got, Jones. Jermaine Jones. Well, he's been battling injuries for the New England Revolution right now, so right. that's why so he didn't get the call up. Right, and that's a very unfortunate because he's one of those another one of those workhorses that you mm-hmm. just love to have on their team. Um, Absolutely. So I guess that's kind of why Kyle Beckerman is in there, but he's not nearly the same player that Jermaine Jones is. No, was. no. Uh, Jermaine Jones is a dynamic center defensive mid player that can shoot the ball from just about anywhere. Kyle Beckerman's a very good distributor and a good guy that can hang back to help support defensive play, but he is not an outright breakout midfielder that you need that will contribute positively right. to the attack. And then lastly, looking at the forwards, Corey, uh, we have Josie Altador, Clint Dempsey, Aaron Johansson, and Chris Wanda. Why the heck is he on the team? Lowski. Yeah. Uh, Chris Wondolowski does not deserve to be on the U.S. Men's National Team anymore. Mm-hmm. I never have really liked him on the team, especially after his showing at the last World Cup. Need I say his point-blank miss that would have won the game against Belgium? The only thing that he's good at, and he missed it. Yeah, literally. He is one of the best snipers in Major League Soccer, and he missed the snipe. Yeah. Anyway. And it's given to him. Yeah. My I- My real question is why is Bobby Wood or... Jordan Morris not on this team. Yeah, especially with the way that they've been playing. Yeah, because Aaron Johansson hasn't done much. Josie Altador hasn't done much. Clint Dempsey just ripped up a ref's book and threw it in his face because he didn't like the call on him. Like, no. I just... I don't I don't agree. This team is is got a lot of questions compared to the team that put together those wins against Germany and the Netherlands. Yes. Now, and this team certainly has experience, though. Uh, 17 of these players were on the 2014 World Cup roster, so maybe that's what Klinsman was thinking. He's like, hey, uh, maybe we can take that uh, experience and apply it to a younger set of players on this team. Um, in terms of goals being scored, Dempsey's got five goals in Gold Cup play. Wondolowski's got five goals. Um, all five, though, of Wondolowski's goals came at the 2013 Gold Cup, where he tied for the tournament's gold boot. So there's that. Uh, Dempsey is the only two-time winner and a only three-time participant. So in that regards, sure. Um, other than that, honestly, Michael Bradley, sure, he'll be that clog in the midfield, but I don't know. I'm not 100% thrilled with this roster. Uh, some people that I was reading, uh, there was articles about this team on MajorLeagueSoccer.com or MLSSoccer.com. And some fans were saying, this is the best men's national team we've had in a long time. And other fans are like, you guys are going to get steamrolled. I'm like, probably, yeah. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I really don't know about this men's national team. I haven't known for a while. I'm a firm believer that the women's team can and will beat the men's national team if they would ever play, even though Mm -hmm. I know they never will. But I am excited that FIFA 16 will have the U.S. women's national team in it. Right. And if there is an option to play <laughs> men's versus women's, I will do it. And yeah. I will play with the women's team, and I will literally crush the men's team. Anytime. Knowing FIFA, though, they will probably not make it possible. Probably. You probably only can play female teams because there's going to be 12 female national teams in the game. Yeah. More than likely, they won't let you play any men's teams. But you better believe I will do everything in my power to find a way. I'm sure there's going to be some sort of game hacked. I could. hope so. I will. Yeah, I've never wanted to buy. I've never. Wa- I've never pre-ordered a game in my life, and I'm. I have to ask my wife's permission if I can pre-order FIFA 16. 
She'd probably say no because it's probably, not, it. she's probably not in the budget. Just She'll probably say, like, save it for, like, a child or a puppy or something. Um, well, okay, you can't go wrong with a puppy. No, they're adorable. The child I would push off a little bit. Well, you know, we'll see. We'll see. But we'll the see. puppy. I, puppies are cute. As long as they stay a puppy. Yes. Then they po- not necessarily possible. We'll have to get, like, a little wiener dog or something. Get a Pomsky. A Pomsky? What's a Pomsky? It's, it's, a, it's a puppy husky. Oh, it's, it's, that sounds adorable. It I want a like husky. A, she wants a golden retriever. I want a husky. Yeah, but so golden we, retrievers just shed all the time. Yeah, I know. We just dog sat for a, a golden retriever last week, and our back seat is still full of dog hair. My work bag is full of dog hair. But see, if you get a Look, pumps, I don't understand the type of stress that that has to put me through on a daily basis when I'm like <laughs> trying to like flip through my bag. I don't know. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. Anyway, soccer, soccer, not dogs. Um, so we'll see what happens with the Gold Cup. Um, that kicks off in July. So we'll see how the U.S. men's national team does. I would still go with what's working, not with what you've done in the past. Because yeah, we well, saw in that's 2014. That's not how plays. Didn't really work. You should know by now. That's not how Jurgen Klinsman plays. I know it, but... but come on, Corey. Come on. No. No, you're right. No, I agree. Um, one other thing I want to talk about, Corey, before we go to one last break and play I Believe as well. Um, is that when we were we little lads back in Scotland, uh, that's not it, uh, when we were li- we little lads, uh, we played backyard soccer. Backyard soccer, in my opinion, is arguably one of the best, well, the backyard sports series is arguably the best sports franchise that has ever existed. Say what you will about Madden and NBA and FIFA and this, that, and the other. The backyard sports series are what truly defined the development of children into athletes today. And it started with the backyards. Before you had the Maddens and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they were around, but they weren't they really weren't, relevant. No. I mean, anything that kids talked about was the backyard oh, games. Oh, yeah. I had, for me, when I was growing up, when I played backyard baseball as a kid, when you would play outdoor real backyard baseball with your friends, you weren't, oh, I'm Sammy Sosa, I'm Mark McGuire. No, you're like, I'm... Pete Wheeler, I'm yeah. Pablo Sanchez, I'm whoever, Tony Del Vecchio, you know, all those guys. Yeah. So I wanted to go through and tell I have my backyard soccer team from when I was a kid still instilled in my brain, and I wanted to tell you my roster, and then you can kind of tell me some of your players to your favorite go-to players. So well, I don't know if I remember my team. <laughs> well, as you look at the list, as you go through this list, I feel like you might pick out some of these players. Um my team was a little unconventional. I was called the Blue Hornets. Okay. Um, but we were yellow and purple. We weren't blue. Um, and we were bees. You honestly. know what yellow and purple makes? Viking colors. Yes, I know. I didn't, I mean. You could have picked anything better than the Viking colors. But it was colors. a contrast because I wasn't blue. I don't know. I was young and impressionable. What do you want from me? Anyway, uh, my team consisted of Ahmed Khan. Um, Billy Jean Blackwood. Um, where's the rest of them? Shoot, come back. Kenny Kawaguchi, who is my leading goal scorer, which is a bit ironic that a kid in a wheelchair was your leading goal scorer. But yeah. It was backyard sports. Anything was possible. Um, Lisa Crockett was on my team. She was a boss on defense and could fill in a goalie if I needed her. Pablo Sanchez was obviously on my team. Uh, the Weber sisters were both on my team as well. And I think that was it. I was I lost count, but I'm pretty sure that was my team. Um, so obviously Pablo Sanchez, four soccer balls out of four for speed, a true master of the midfield, a maestro, as they would say. Um, aside from Pablo Sanchez, though, I feel like looking across. Um, the the Khan brothers were always very good. Amir mm-hmm. and Ahmed Khan were very cons- uh, very dangerous with their shooting. Um, although I was a bit surprised that somebody like Kenny Kawaguchi was as good at shooting as he was. Mm-hmm. Um, I um, who were some of the players that you always had to have on your team, Corey? Well, I don't know if it was a necessarily a had to, but one player that I, I really remember was Dante Robinson. Yes. That was always... He was, he's really good in basketball and football. Right. Um, and for some reason, I picked him. Oh, I know why. Because of the defense. Yes. And I stuck him on defense and shot everyone out. Yeah. You know who really bothered me, though, to play against was Reese Worthington. Oh, the really? short, little, 
white haired, white haired blonde kid. Couldn't have been more than, you know, three foot nothing. Like he was just a short little guy, but he was super annoying to go against because of how good he was on defense. Yeah. But that's just me. Um, other than that, though, I mean, really, though, some of these players, um, Stephanie Morgan, obviously trying way too hard to be good. Um, she was one soccer ball out of four on kicking and control. She was four out of four soccer balls on defense, though, so obviously she knew what she was doing. Uh, Vicky Kawaguchi, though, Kenny's little sister, um, one of the better all-around players. Um, out of eight total soccer balls, she scored 6.5 out of eight. So obviously a very good player in that regards. Um, but the the best player in backyard sports, according to this rankings, uh, I think was actually Vicky. Yeah, that's her. Huh. Listen, you got a couple at six. Yeah, there's a few at six. Dante Robinson was at six. But no six. one's other than 6.5. Yeah, Lisa Crockett, six. What was Pablo at? Where's the love for Pablo? Pablo's at five and a half. Pablo, what are you doing? Japers, well. He was more of a baseball guy, though. Yeah. Pablo Sanchez was your your DH. Um, he was too small for football. I always thought he just got. Torque. It was, you know, physics and stuff, Corey. I, I don't know what you want from me. Huh. It's just that's just kind of, kind of how it was in those days back in the, the backyard era. So uh, we are going to go to. One more break. When we come back, we will have our I Believe segment and wrap up a, another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to another edition of Two Up Front, presented by Sports Radio America. I am Baxter Colburn, joined by Corey Plath. No Simon Provan this week, as he is off on assignment in Portland, doing a lot of fun acting things and soccer things and things and stuff. I don't know. He's having a good old time. I need to get out west one of these days. Uh, but Corey has done a stellar job so far of joining me throughout the show as we have talked about the Women's World Cup uh, the men's CONCACAF Gold Cup, and then backyard soccer as well for a brief time. Uh, but it is the end of the show, Corey, which means we first have to do one more segment, which, as most of you listening know, is... It's just a fantastic chant, honestly. It's our I Believe segment, and the way that works is that Corey and I will both make an I Believe statement about something in the soccer world. For example, this is not mine, but I believe that China will upset the U.S. women's national team. That would be an I Believe statement. But that is not my I Believe. My I Believe, for, for real, Corey, for real, is... Uh, mine's going to be funny. Uh, I believe that in order to replace Lauren Holiday and Christine Rampone, Jill Ellis should call in Vicky Kawaguchi to play midfield for the women's national team. Christine Rampone or Megan? Megan. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Whatever. They're the same person. That's their fault for having similar last names. Yeah. And for you, sir? Well, first of all, I have to say that I believe Chan always gives me goosebumps. Right? It's so awesome. Oh, my gosh. I but for me... My I believe statement is a big one. I believe that in the final, it's going to be the U.S. and Australia what? rematch in the group what? stages. You heard it here, folks. Corey Plath predicting the U.S. and Australia in the 2015 World Cup finals. Wow. That's a big one. Isn't that's, it? that's real big. I'm going to have to like, buy you dinner if you get that right. Oh, you can buy me dinner anyways. Oh, okay. All your big bucks now. Right? Got a big boy job. Money. No. 
All right, Corey Plath, thank you so much for joining me this week on another edition of Two Up Front. Uh, did you have fun? You seemed like you survived. Oh, it was a blast. Good. It was a I blast. I'd do it, it anytime. Uh, let us know what you thought of Corey filling in for Simon this week. We appreciate it. Remember, you can check us out on social media at Two Up Front Soccer on Twitter and on Facebook, Two Up Front. Remember, you can listen to us on Sports Radio America and SportsRadioAmerica.com. Tune in and Live 365 on Fridays from 3 to 6 Eastern. Then you can listen to us on demand anytime on Spreaker.com and on iTunes as well. He's Corey Plath. I'm Baxter Colburn. With our manager being the one above, we are two up front. Enjoy your day, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>